Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, new edition of the ESDR Kitchen webinars. So I'm, I'm, I am uh, Julien Sénéchal, a dermatologist working in Bordeaux. And um, as you know, uh, the ESDR Kitchens are composed of uh, four sessions. And today is a recipe book where new techniques uh, are uh, presented for research in dermatology. And I let now uh, my uh, co-chair, uh, Professor Eniko Sankoli, to uh, introduce our speaker of today. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the uh, introduction, Julian. And uh, I am very happy to welcome uh, Professor Ellen van den Bogard uh, in this session of the recipe book um, of the ESDR Kitchen, which is kindly supported by Pfizer. So I would like to just to say a few words about uh, um, our presenter, Professor Ellen van den Bogard. She is the head of the Laboratory for Experimental Dermatology at the Department of Dermatology at Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands. And she's also affiliated to the Radboud Institute for Molecular Life Sciences as a principal investigator. Now, Ellen is trained in biomedical sciences and she completed her PhD in 2014 with the highest distinction. And I think as many of you may know, her main expertise is the development and application of advanced cell culture models and organotypic skin models to study skin biology as well as skin diseases. So her lab is part of two large European consortia and uh, she has received multiple personal grants and fellowships. And she's also luckily an active member of the ESDR, also a, a future leader alumni. And she's also uh, the member of the Epidermal Barrier Research Network. So I won't spend more of your time. Uh, please, Ellen van den Bogard, you're welcome to start your presentation. Thank you very much, Eniko. It's a pleasure to be here. And actually seeing almost 90 people as my audience. So that's, uh, that's fantastic. Okay. So I hope this is okay. Um, so today I will be uh, um, presenting the work uh, um, that we and also others uh, uh, um, do on the development of these uh, uh, organotypic models to study skin disease, pathophysiology, um, and, uh, and therapeutics. Um, oh, it should be therapeutics, not disease. Anyway. So the topics that I would like to discuss today, since this is a recipe um, a section of the EZR Kitchen, um, it's about um, what are the, um, uh, the key ingredients for making a good organotypic model and how we can use this recipe in making these organotypic models to make it into a successful dish and uh, to specific, uh, and for the specific flavors. So um, I will mostly be talking about epidermal equivalents made out of keratinocytes, uh, discuss the culture protocols, the quality controls, and a nice example on how to uh, use these experimental models uh, for CRISPR-Cas mediated uh, genome editing to study gene function um, uh, in a tissue-like environment. So I think this needs very little, um, a very little introduction. Um, the skin uh, obviously composed of, of the layers, uh, the dermis and the epidermis, where the keratinocytes remain in the epidermis, where we have the different strata of the epidermis, the basal layer, the stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, the granular layer, and then the cornified layer. And um, in making these organotypic models, it's obviously key in faithfully recapitulating uh, this type of tissue structure uh, that also has a similar function as it would have in vivo because you would want to model uh, the skin and skin physiology and not just for the purpose of making a nice in vitro model. So you should faithfully recapitulate um, uh, normal skin physiology. And uh, by doing so, um, you can make a model where uh, you would have in the basal layer, um, let me see whether I can make my pointer, um, where you have in the basal layer, you would have your proliferation. So also in vitro in these, in these epidermal models, um, these should be made uh, due to proliferation of the cells in the basal layer that then form the different layers 
all the way to the surrounding corneum, and that you can really nicely follow the development of such models uh, for also studying, for example, developmental diseases. So when uh, looking at the keratinocytes, uh, they obviously, they're not just my favorite cell type. Uh, a lot of um, people in our community work on the, um, on the science and, and the biology of these keratinocytes. Um, have important functions in, uh, in, in skin homeostasis. Um, and obviously when things go wrong in these keratinocytes, they can lead to disease. So for example, blistering diseases, when keratinocytes do not anchor well to the, to the basement membrane, or you have keratin uh, mutations that make the keratinocytes fragile. Uh, and if key roles being innate immune cells in inflammatory and infectious diseases, um, because of the cornification and, um, and the desquamation processes, uh, whenever there's anything wrong with the formation of the stratum corneum, you could end up with very dry skin, like in ichthyosis. Um, and then obviously they're involved in squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. Um, so a lot of research into these keratinocytes, how do they function in health and disease, um, is for understanding the biology, um, the disease mechanisms, and for then eventually to, uh, to aid um, in the drug development and target identification, et cetera. So um, traditionally, most of this research has been done in experimental models, uh, transgenic models, um, knockout models to study gene function, genotype, phenotype correlations. But um, there has been a really a surge in the, um, uh, in the number of studies that are using now organotypic models as alternatives for these in, vi in vivo uh, mouse models. Um, definitely um, uh, a big help was the ban on the animal testing for cosmetics, hence the need for making those organotypic skin models for, uh, for safety testing in toxicology. But now we're making use of this in, uh, in our scientific studies as well. So uh, a quick word on the nomenclature on these 3D skin models, because um, we use different uh, wordings for sometimes the same uh, model, but there's also distinctions to make. So when talking about these organotypic models, they're often referred to as 3D culture models or 3D skin models or reconstructed skin. All is fine, uh, but there are two uh, specific distinctions, and that is the use in uh, human skin equivalents or human epidermal equivalents. Generally, when talking about human skin equivalents, it means that Besides the epidermis, you would also have a dermis. When talking about human epidermal equivalents, these organotypic models would only consist out of keratinocytes. And that is depicted here. So when making these models, you obviously start mostly from cells that come from native skin, so from plastic surgery or from patients, uh, where you can enzymatically digest and with mechanical uh, dissociation, you can take out the fibroblasts from the dermis and take the keratinocytes out of the epidermis. Or nowadays, we also have some nice immortalized light cell lines to do this, which I will come back to later. We then grow these cells, isolate them, expand them, and then later on put them back into a petri dish in a specified uh, cell culture uh, protocol to make these 3D epidermal models where you can either grow them on a plastic filter which is indicated here in blue with the blue box showing the histology, or when culturing them, for example, on native dermis, which is made acellular, which is de-epidermized dermis, or DED, uh, which you see in the, in the red box. And um, there's a potential of making a uh, full thickness uh, skin equivalent with having a fibroblast populated dermis. Um, if you want to look into research on how to make those fibroblast populated dermal um, matrices, for the seeding of keratinocytes. Um, there are a lot of people uh, doing uh, it really well. Uh, I particularly like the research of, um, of, a, of a colleague and friend of mine uh, from the group from the Leiden University Medical Center. Um, there's a lot of uh, publication on how to make those um, de-epidermized dermis, repopulating them with fibroblasts, seeding them in extracellular matrix gels like in collagen gels, or having a self-assembly method where you basically let the fibroblasts make their own matrix, make their own dermis, and then seed the keratinocytes on top to also have that interaction between keratinocytes and fibroblasts. Um, but as I said today, it would mostly be about epidermal models. Um, so to make those epidermal models, we obviously need keratinocytes, and we want to have human keratinocytes because we want to make human models. Uh, well, for that, there are different um, uh, options available, uh, either having adult skin, so if you 
see in literature adult human keratinocytes is mostly keratinocytes from um, plastic surgery, surplus material, like from abdominal plasties or breast reductions. Um, but obviously there's also a, a large supply of other uh, skin material, for example, from um, uh, the, the juvenile skin, from foreskin uh, excisions, where you can also isolate the keratinocytes from. Then there's a distinction between healthy keratinocytes or you make uh, organotypic models from specific patients. For example, atopic dermatitis patients, psoriasis patients, or patients with blistering diseases, et cetera, to make uh, those faithful mimicking models of the patient. Um, now these would all be primary cells, uh, but these primary keratinocytes, they also have um, um, a limitation, and that's their lifespan in vitro. Uh, those foreskins, they grow uh, uh, quite well until a very long time, but adult keratinocytes generally do not survive until uh, five or six passages. And then if you want to do, for example, extensive uh, subculturing studies needed uh, for genome editing uh, purposes uh, in this case, then uh, you would need to have immortalized cells. Um, another option uh, became available uh, lately is the use of induced pluripotent stem cell derived keratinocytes, which I will not touch upon, but I will also provide some uh, literature references um, of uh, um, our colleagues in our field that are using this approach to generate like an unlimited cell source for making keratinocytes. So briefly touching upon these, um, uh, where you could get these cells from, uh, keratinocytes are commercially available. If you type it in Google, then you would get uh, websites from uh, companies like HCC or Lonza, Cellentex, Sigma Albury, uh, everyone seems to be selling these, uh, these keratinocytes. Those are most often neonatal foreskin keratinocytes. Some supply also uh, human uh, adult keratinocytes from breast. Um, they can be either from single or pool donors, but bear in mind that cells do not come cheap. You, buy, you have to pay about 500 euros per one vial of about 1 million cells. So if you do this on a regular basis, this is a quite a costly um, endeavor. So that is why we and others uh, mostly um, generate them ourselves to make in-house cell banks. And you can do this uh, with different methods, either with uh, the Reinhold Green method, already published uh, in 1975, uses uh, the mouse fibroblast feeder layers in the, in the DMEM HAMS F12 uh, culture medium. Or nowadays, we also have defined xeno-free uh, culture systems, where you either have collagen-coated plates with a defined media to isolate those keratinocytes. And for that, uh, as I showed you in the picture before, you often use an enzymatic digestion uh, of your biopsies and then collect the keratinocytes and grow them. Uh, the iPSC-derived cells, uh, there are different uh, protocols for the differentiation of these iPSCs towards keratinocytes. Uh, the success rates are varying. We are having um, a varying, various quality of the maturation of these keratinocytes, and not all make nice organotypic models. Uh, I think the group from uh, Dusko Ilic at King's College London uh, does a really nice job, and there are some few papers um, also showing organotypic models made from these induced keratinocytes. And then there's another option uh, which could provide a good alternative for primary cells if you do not have uh, uh, these cells available or when it becomes too costly, and that is the use of immortalized cell lines. Uh, traditionally, I think in the literature, you most often find high cut uh, cells. Um, they have some downsides, which I will discuss in the next slide. And uh, recently, uh, we are mostly working with entered keratinocytes, which I will also um, touch upon. So these HACOT keratinocytes, um, they are, in principle, okay keratinocytes for submerged cultures. Nowadays, also, uh, there are some publications showing um, uh, a good quality of skin equivalents. Uh, but mostly, uh, if you compare the, the human, uh, the normal human epidermal keratinocytes, so the NHEC um, uh, cells versus the HACL cells, the HACL cells have a, um, have a difficult time in making the proper layers of the epidermis. So the differentiation is um, mostly off, and there's uh, hardly any stratum corneum forming. I know, now know that uh, some groups are, are making better models, but this has been the um, the, the field for, for most uh, groups where you have these kinds of sort of stratified models, but it's, it's not near a, um, a organotypic model of skin. And then there's another issue if you want to use them for cross editing is that these hackers are, um, they have multiple uh, chromosomes. So the, uh, 
uh, the hackers are a nucleoid, which makes it really unfavorable for genome editing, because then instead of having to target uh, two alleles, you have to target uh, even four or five. So an alternative uh, to this um, could be uh, the use of enterocuratinocytes. And we came across this cell line uh, already uh, five years ago. Uh, they were initially developed by the Reinwald lab, uh, who also is like, uh, I always call them the founding fathers of our curatinocyte cultures, uh, the Reinwald and Green uh, protocols. And Jim Reinwald generated these enter one and enter 2 G lines here from foreskin. Um, they used the, the, the viral transduction, it was a retrovirus, uh, retrovirus with the human telomerase reverse transcriptase to make sure that the telomeres are kept, uh, um, uh, are sustained. And they found that once these cells became immortal, there was a spontaneous defect of the P16 cell cycle control mechanism, making them uh, um, resistant for differentiation and keeping in proliferation state. So what we've done after acquiring these cells, we, um, uh, we, took, uh, we took it uh, to us to make a, uh, not only an experimental study, but also a literature review. And that's what uh, my uh, PhD student uh, back in the days and now my postdoc, Jos Smith did, um, uh, publishing in, in scientific reports, a really nice paper in the characteristics of these entered cells. Um, what we have also have done is to analyze the fluidity of these cells and actually finding that they are um, diploid cells, making them really perfectly suitable for genome editing strategies. We compared the base gene expression levels, features of these epidermal equivalents, which you see on the right, and also response to pro-inflammatory cytokine stimulations to see how well they faithfully mimic primary cells. So this is an example of such a study uh, where we also uh, harvested these entered keratinocyte organotypics in time of culture. And then you really nicely see that these models are made out of the normal stratification process. So when you start with a monolayer, this monolayer differentiate or starts to proliferate, making additional layers. These layers that differentiate, first you have spinosum, then the funulosum comes on top, and finally you have terminal uh, differentiation and cornification taking place. This, um, these models generate functional uh, organotypic, so there's a barrier uh, in place, either from the inside out, shown here by biotin, where the staining is stopped at uh, the, the, the stratum granulosum layer one, uh, where the tight junctions are, or by um, resistance to dye permeation, here shown with this yellow. Um, we simulated these models with various cytokines, either for atopic dermatitis or for psoriasis, and finding that they respond in a similar fashion to these cytokines here shown for the uh, downregulation of epidermal differentiation genes upon the uh, TH2 uh, cytokine simulation, which we know to be true for primary cells. And then there's a nice study also from the, the group in, uh, in Leiden, uh, where they use these entered keratinocytes, which you see here on the bottom panel with NHSE, uh, to make these full thickness skin equivalents uh, with the self-assembly method. Uh, generating matrix from fibroblasts and then seeding these entered keratinocytes on top. And then you also see that these keratinocytes work really well uh, in this setting too. So now talking about these general culture protocol uh, principles, having discussed already the, the keratinocytes that you would need to make them, is that I think every lab does it a little bit differently, but what it boils down to is that you have a certain type of transwell culture setup which makes it uh, um, easy to lower medium levels or to raise the, the transwell so that you can have a culture at the air liquid interface. Meaning that in the beginning, cells grow submerged at monolayer, um, forming a monolayer on top of the, of, the, of the filter of the insert. And then uh, once this monolayer is formed, you lower the medium level, having cells being air exposed on top, only having medium in the lower compartments, and that is a very strong trigger for the differentiation and the formation of the, the barrier. And then the time period, so when do you harvest, at what day, that's really variable and depending on your keratinocyte donor. Typically for primary cells, it's about day eight uh, of this air liquid interface culture. For the entered, it's about day 10. So different culture of media uh, is possible um, from different vendors and it's about uh, setting up your own a culture protocol for your, um, for your likings and your specific cells. Um, the use of antibiotics is something that, um, that we uh, do not uh, do anymore in the lab. We have a completely antibiotic-free culture. 
because we've seen that in the setup that we've used and, and the culture medium that we use, the antibiotics use is really detrimental for um, your proliferation and differentiation. And the system is much more robust, leaving a high quality um, in the, um, uh, with, uh, with uh, omitting the use of antibiotics. So this is what morphology looks like when you harvest them in, in due time, seeing that because there's no desquamation uh, in these models that uh, there's a pile up of stratum corneum, but the keratinocytes keep on proliferating, uh, but the epidermal thickness uh, becomes a little bit less in due time. Um, for that, we have different harvesting methods uh, that you can apply for these organotypic models. Um, with having either looking at cell proliferation or uh, at barrier measurements, for example, resistance or transepidermal water loss or dirt dye permeation. And um, we have uh, specific ways in harvesting these models. And we always use a biopsy punch for this to really cut out nicely uh, the inside of the, um, uh, of the epidermal equivalent to then divide it in different pieces so that you can have multiple uh, output parameters from one single uh, construct. Then a final slide on the quality checks, because quality checks are key. Like histology is the, the main thing that you should always uh, take into account uh, to check whether you have a good quality epidermis, whether you maybe have bacterial infections uh, uh, because we culture with antibiotics and not in the, in the culture media. And then also to check whether your tissue processing has gone well, um, because uh, if you have them at a slight angle, uh, what you see here on the bottom, which you can see from the looks of the filter, uh, where the keratinocytes are grown on, then you get a thicker uh, epidermis. So it may seem that you have acanthosis in your culture, but it's actually from uh, having um, an angled embedding uh, for the histology processing. So it's really key to have these specific permit, uh, parameters for your quality checks. And we wrote a nice piece uh, in the JID on this after a Gordon Research Conference, where we heavily discussed the use and uh, application of these models, um, uh, where we at least provide a a consensus opinion on what the minimum requirements should be for uh, the quality checks on these uh, equivalents. So then uh, a few final slides on this application of these epidermal models and how we implement uh, the, the, the workflow for CRISPR-Cas editing and studying gene function um, is that uh, we try to mimic uh, disease mutations in vitro. And for that, I have a, a proof of concept study and an example where we have uh, knocked down the filigrin gene uh, in vitro, uh, trying to model atopic dermatitis and ichthyosis vulgaris. There are multiple ways of doing this, either by using, for example, patient-derived cells, but then you have um, heterogeneous genetic backgrounds. Um, and we took the advantage of these entered cultures um, and harnessing them with CRISPR-Cas uh, system. So as I said, we use the CRISPR-Cas system with a guide uh, RNA specific for filigrin to induce a double strand break uh, in the filigrin gene, and then let the DNA repair itself, which often leads to frame shift mutations and, uh, and a stop codon, and you have loss of, um, of functional, loss of function mutations. And for that, we wanted to study what the functional role would be for filigrin in, um, in skin health. Um, for that, we took, uh, uh, because this is the work of like seven years, and we've been to multiple labs discussing this. We've been at the lab from Yves Poumé at, uh, at the University of uh, uh, Namur, discussing uh, issues with this CRISPR-Cas because everyone seemed to have issues um, and not getting this to work. Um, and that's also reflected by the number of papers, what you see here, uh, that use CRISPR-Cas9 uh, um, uh, versus uh, the only small number, like 49 papers, using CRISPR-Cas9 in keratinocytes, uh, which uh, Jos, again, did a good job in reviewing the literature, which was recently accepted in, uh, in JID innovations. Uh, one reason for this is that it's really difficult to get this CRISPR-Cas machinery into the cells. And uh, for that, we uh, teamed up with uh, the, the lab from Lisa Beck. Uh, they uh, wanted to write a piece on how to deliver these CRISPR-Cas components into epidermal cells. And if you want to look up on this, uh, there's a research technique to make simple uh, publication on this. What we've come up with is a, an electroporation protocol where we have RMP complexes being electroporated into the keratinocytes. And this is the scheme that we use uh, to do this. So first we have electroporation. Uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 does its job in editing the gene. Uh, we do a genomic analysis of these electroporated cells, um, looking uh, with Sanger sequencing whether the DNA is indeed uh, disturbed. 
doing a validation uh, of the knockouts in the, in the models. And in number four, you see that this is bulk uh, cells. So these are not yet cloned. So you already see quite a high efficiency and there's like a heterozygous uh, phenotype almost with a patchy filigrane staining pattern. Then we cloned uh, these, these cells. Uh, again, I validated the genotype of clonal lines uh, with Sanger sequencing. And then again, doing a knockout uh, analysis. And then you see that these keratinocytes that are a knockout for keratinocytes are fully devoid uh, of, for filigrin, the filigrin staining in number seven. So that seems to really work out nicely now. But what then the additional trick uh, to do, step to do is that if you have generated this knockout line, there could also always be potential of target effects in then using this line to rescue um, the genotype again. Again with CRISPR-Cas9, but then with a different approach where you provide a template DNA with the correct sequence uh, back in place to correct these cells. And that's what you see here where we reinstate the filigrin um, protein. And then now the time has come to do a bunch of uh, readouts and uh, follow-up analysis, which is what we're currently doing. So in conclusion, uh, when making these 3D epidermal organotypic models, uh, it's about keratinocyte cell sources. Choose wisely. Which cells do you want to use for your specific research question? There are different types of organotypic culture protocols, uh, but always be, be sure to, uh, to take along your quality controls. They have a really good application for studying skin biology and disease mechanisms, either as also a prediction tool, for example, for modeling this process in human skin, and they could be a well uh, alternative also for experimental animal, animals in case of specific research questions, which I'm sure you would also have for me. So that is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Helen, for this uh, very great presentation and very clear and uh, uh, how you show that you implement some innovative uh, techniques in your model, especially CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out genes. So uh, we, we have a question. So uh, when you use a 3D epidermis uh, model to study keratinocyte differentiation, so do you compare the thickness in addition to immunofluorescence analysis of markers. Yes, um, so it's about uh, morphology. So whether you have all of the layers present, whether the stratification uh, took place. And then we always have a specific set of uh, a panel, let's say of proliferation and differentiation markers to see whether marker proteins are on the correct layers of the, of the skin. Um, so there's a, a consensus again on what these type of markers should be which is in the, in the JID paper, um, what at least the field seems to recommend should be proper markers for differentiation and proliferation. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Ellen, for the, your very nice presentation. Actually, I have a question myself, if you allow that. So if, if you treat this uh, 3D epidermal equivalence with different cytokines, um, so do, is there any general rule? Do they respond? to the cytokines more, are they more sensitive to the cytokines as compared to the 2D cultures? Or are they less mm -hmm. sensitive? Or what is your, is, is, do you have um, any experience in that? And what, what would you mm -hmm. say? I mean, if we, if, we, if we compare 2D to 3D, how should we think? Yeah. yeah, I think first of all, 3D is not always the answer. <laughs> uh, if you have a good uh, uh, readout, uh, then 2D cultures, monolayers are well suited. So it's not always in, in from wanting to do everything in 3D. If you want to uh, um, see effects on stratification, et cetera, then I think 3D is, is a way to go. For example, if you want to do microbiome interaction studies, et cetera. Um, whether it's more sensitive to cytokines, um, I think with, with regards to uh, like your inflammatory markers, like if we add psoriasis associated cytokines to monolayers versus 3D skin models, then uh, if it's just a protein that can be produced by any type of cell, then uh, it doesn't matter. You have similar uh, fold, change, uh, fold changes. If it's, for example, um, mostly um, uh, proteins that are um, in, in late differentiated cells, like in strong granulosum, uh, and you do not let your monolayers um, differentiate long enough, then you could have lower levels of your uh, marker genes because you do not have the, the, the state of differentiation and, and cells um, uh, that would normally respond uh, to, to the cytokine mixture. So 
it depends on the on, on the readout. Uh, but in general, we see similar uh, responses. Uh, it's not that uh, monolayers um, do not respond at all, where versus 3D cultures always respond. It really depends on the uh, on the gene of interest. Absolutely, that makes sense. Thank you very much. And um, another question: So, uh, can this uh, 3D model mm -hmm. sculptures can be used in uh, wound wound treatments? Yeah, yeah. I think it's already been done, uh, especially for smaller areas uh, with diabetic wounds, etc. Uh, they use this approach to culture autologous cells uh, for uh, making uh, like the epi epidermal rafts uh, to culture them. And I think like the the best ever uh, uh, example is the, is the paper published by uh, um, um, the, the epidermal, epidermalysis bullosa case with, uh, where they transplanted uh, a boy, almost 80% of his whole skin was transplanted with, uh, with keratinocytes that were grown um, uh, in the lab, not to, to the extent of these 3D epidermal cultures, but they were grown like in fibrin uh, grafts into like a mono layer, a second layer, and then they transplanted it to the, to the boy with, uh, with EB and they had this uh, gene therapy um, uh, ex vivo. And that all also proved uh, the, um, the potential lifespan of keratinocytes if you do the isolation well. So we always think that the, the lifespan is, a, is, is an issue with primary cells, but if you select for specific cells in your culture, the holoclones that uh, Jim Reinbold described um, in his first papers, and if you use these holoclones, then these cells can proliferate uh, uh, to enormous extents where you can transplant the full body and that these holoclones that you've isolated in vitro also stick in vivo and they regenerate the, the epidermis uh, um, uh, in vivo uh, because they still have their stem cell properties. So it's a fantastic paper in nature uh, by Hirsch et al. Yeah, thank you. That's absolutely fantastic for the development of dermatology as well. There mm. is another question about the stratum corneum, which you showed that, that, that the stratum corneum is accumulating in these models, uh, which could be a problem for some studies like UV irradiation, for example. So the question is if you ever tried to reduce or prevent the stratum corneum formation. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, uh, that's indeed a problem. Well, the, the one way to prevent this is to start your treatment earlier than the stratum corneum is forming. So you just, the only thing is that you do not have your fully differentiated cells then. And we tried tape stripping in vitro, like the tape stripping that you also do in vivo to remove stratum corneum. Uh, we tried that in vitro uh, to get rid of the, the, the amount of stratum corneum. The only thing is that if you have these epidermal cultures that are uh, cultured on the plastic filters, um, the, uh, there's a really big chance that uh, after two or three, two or three tape strips, you rip everything off because the, the connection of the basal cells to the filter is not that strong. Uh, but you can, get, you can get rid of a, a few layers, but the extensive packing of the stratum corneum is really difficult. There's no way in washing or whatever, you just need to stop your cultures earlier. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe uh, some last question, but uh, many questions. Uh, uh, so, uh, so this one is, um, what is your opinion on the 3D printing model used as a skin model? Yeah, the, the, the bioprinting is, um, could be uh, maybe our future. Um, it's still, um, I know there are a few studies showing bioprinting. For example, uh, if you want to look up on this, uh, it's a group in the NIH from Marc Ferrer. Uh, they do a lot of bioprinting and also bioprinting of skin. Um, definitely an issue. The only thing is that uh, at least for us to buy such a bioprinter in the lab, it's uh, quite uh, uh, expensive. So I think for companies, et cetera, and if we if would really get this regeneration, regenerative medicine up and going uh, with these keratinocytes and the bioprinting, would I think definitely make things more standardized because now it's all manual labor. Um, so there's, a, there's definitely um, a future there for the bioprinting. There's already uh, some very good studies in showing the applicability of bioprinting for, the, for making 3D skin models. Yeah. I think there's also a nice one, if I can, because I'm also looking at the chat about these T cells and dendritic cells and mast cells in the 3D skin culture. Um, uh, yes, we, we've been doing the T-cells uh, with the combination of the devitalized dermis, 
to make a psoriasis model that works really well. Or there's also studies um, that are from um, Roxanne, uh, the France names, maybe you can help me, Julianne, but Roxanne Pouillot, Pouillot. <laughs> uh, they do the, the, the seeding of the, of the cells in, in the collagen gels uh, in the dermis uh, using either uh, uh, immune cells from psoriasis patients or from healthy volunteers where you can generate a psoriasis phenotype that works well. Dendrit dendritic cells are, um, uh, the dermal dendritic cells, uh, we tried it with micro-injection to make a melanoma model where you have your T cells, dendritic cells, melanoma cells to see the interaction in the immune environment. Uh, that, that seems to work well, but it's the only thing that you need to bear in mind, uh, and that's what there was a lot of discussion is, is uh, we all strive from getting as much cell types into this 3D skin model as possible to make it as faithfully mimicking the skin. But in vitro, you have these very complex uh, skin, skin culture conditions where every cell type has its own requirements and growth factors. And what is good for one cell is really detrimental for another cell. So by adding multiple, multiple, multiple cells in, you could also risk in generating um, uh, artifacts because uh, not every cell is in its best environment. Um, so for that, maybe the, uh, the, the iPSCs would work because then you can really make that all of these cells make their own matrix, et cetera, which was also published in Nature lately for these hair bearing skin organoids that were grown from uh, iPSCs. We actually have hairs growing out of the, out of the organoids. Um, but yeah, with the, with the multicellular models, uh, I always have, uh, we tried it with the T cells and then you see that they can only survive for three or four days and then they die off because they need IL-2 and all of kind of cytokines and that the keratinocytes do not, do not like that kind of medium. So, a bit of the balance. Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, I think it's it's extremely exciting, and I, I'm sure that we could we could sit here for for hours more, maybe days. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> and and there, are, and there are also many questions coming and so on. So so um, for those who have sent questions, you you find Ellen's mail address now in the chat box. Uh, and thank you very much again, Ellen, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you all who have listened, and please thank you, for, uh, don't... Having me. thank you, thank you, and please don't forget to listen to the next episode also of, of the ESDR Kitchen, which will be the molecular cuisine with Muslifa Hanifat. Thank you for today. <laughs>